somebody hot snip bap dip bap 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 you can't see over here, can you? <laughs> of course, I, I read all my weekly comics. I got tucked into the next Astro City Metro book. And I got some other big boy books I'm reading, too. But then, of course, today there's a 30-book week. <laughs> like a big old stack over there again. But now I can do picks of the week from the Marvel Comics group. Whatever leaf. Their sales are really flagging. Actually, I don't think they have been <laughs> doing great. So first up, I got Betsy Braddock, Captain Britain, number one. This is uh, an extension of Knights of X, which is a title I actually dropped some time ago. But I feel like, okay, so back in 2019, late 2019, early 2020, when the whole X line kind of got rebooted, uh, I was I bought all of them, every title up through like the first couple years. And it really wasn't until the last year that I started dropping stuff. And uh, Excalibur by Teeny Howard, or Tiny Howard, I'm not sure how to pronounce the name. I really liked, but I don't know, you know. Like, that's the other thing. The reason I started dropping books was not just because I was kind of just getting sick of them. <laughs> I mean, there's too many. There's just too many books. So what they did first was very clever. And they essentially for the first year tied all the X books together. So I don't think you had to read all of them to follow the story, but if you did, as I did, it would make a complete story. And they did that for the first year. They did that into the first crossover, which was X of swords. They did that into the next crossover, which was the hellfire gala, which was like a smaller, it wasn't an event like, like X of swords was. And then it was around that time that they started doing things like, they would make, uh, well, they made Excalibur and Knights of X. They made, uh, I don't know what Legion of X was before Hellions, maybe, X Factor. Titles were getting canceled, the ones that I liked. <laughs> and Excalibur was one of the titles that I did like, but frankly, there was just too much of the other world going on. So Excalibur, Excalibur, Excalibur is an X book that goes back to the late 80s and as you might guess from the name it is an all british x team very much a chris claremont creation and it was a book that i read as a kid here and there it was a little more expensive as i recollect it was a dollar 50 as opposed to a dollar but i think there was there was better paper and there might have been no ads or fewer ads and I liked it. It was very weird and, and very, like, Nightcrawler and Shadowcat were on the team, although they're definitely not British. But, uh, the book just kind of, I don't know, I lost track of it. But I've always liked it. I've always had a soft spot for Excalibur. So when the new series started, I was into it. Otherworld is a, is a, as a, again, the name might imply, another dimension where Betsy's brother, uh, Jamie Braddock, had been... Mad Jamie Braddock had been ruling for some time. That was the whole X of Swords thing, was battling Araco in Otherworld. I don't want to get into it. My point remains that the Otherworld stuff just got to be kind of too much for me. And there simply just wasn't enough Betty, uh, Betsy. Betsy Braddock is now currently Captain Britain. For a very long time, her older brother, um, <laughs> I just said Jamie, Billy Braddock here, pretty sure that's right, was Captain Britain going back to the 70s. Psylocke, his younger sister, was created in the early 80s, I want to say, and she went through a variety of costume changes, not to mention a full body change. <laughs> I've always liked the character because she was on the X-Men when I started reading X-Men. And at that point, she had a weird, like, it was all purple. 
and a like a cloak and it looked like kind of ren fair fair but it was like super strong armor too they never really knew what to do with her is what i think it was and then in the early 90s they just completely redesigned her and jim lee drew her like a super hot ninja and so teenage boys across the land would play pocket pool while getting their change out to pay for the, for the books and it was that i mean it was kind of at that point that although my crotch was definitely into it my 14 to 15 year old brain was like hey i'm being exploited for my horniness and i don't think i much enjoy it i got to enjoy it later um and then they made her Captain Britain. I believe during X of Swords, she became Captain Britain. And uh, she has been, there's there's Captain Britons from all over the multiverse, and she's the captain of all of them. But she was headquartered in Otherworld, and, and Excalibur and then Knights of X largely took place there. And honest, none of the characters, I mean, even the, I can't remember her name. There's a mean blonde lady that rules Otherworld that, was like the bad guy next to swords. And I'm assuming it had been in Excalibur in times previous, but she looked exactly like Emma Frost and exactly like Megan, who's also on Excalibur, except she's got pointy elf ears, but she looked exactly like Emma Frost. So I'd be reading the book and I go, why is Emma saying all this stuff? She doesn't. Oh, right. Cause it's the other broad. This book is now going to bring Betsy back to Britain and Shea. And so I'm looking forward to that. I mean, it also might be that this book isn't going to last very long. But it's that thing where, like, I was super excited on all the X titles, bought them all, started dropping, like, ones I liked started getting canceled. And then I started dropping ones that were just kind of... Because I like Teeny Howard and I like Cy Spurrier, who did Legion of X. But the books were really just kind of... And I don't have the room for it. Hmm, I got to buy stuff that I'm excited for, which, to be honest, is a little few and far between these days, but I'm excited for it. Betsy, to finally get her own title. I think this is the first time she's had her title. Oh, she's no longer a hot ninja. They only just, <laughs> with uh, when Hickman started the whole line over, and um, one of the things about the X-Men now is that they can reincarnate indefinitely they have the technology and the mutant powers so that if any of them die they can bring and they were able to bring all the dead mutants back so i don't remember the whole story but the whole thing with psylocke was she switched bodies with a character named quanin or quanin i'm not sure how to pronounce it and they have now switched back and quanin was on x factor i believe she was on a team for a minute there or maybe it was hellions i think it was hellions and now Betsy is back to being a white girl. <laughs> All right. Also this week, I bought Local Man number one from the Image Comics group. I was on the fence about this just because I didn't need yet another title. But it's about a superhero who has to move back home to his hometown kind of in disgrace. And it promises to be one of those kind of realistic superhero stories that I'm into. It's written by Tim Seeley, who's most well known for a book called Hack Slash, which I've never read. But I did read, or most of, I'd read most of a book called Revival that he wrote, which was a very fun zombie book, completely different, like a zombie book, but not a zombie book. People were coming back in Revival. That was, it was a similar thing. People were coming back from the dead who had just died. And, and anybody who suffered like a mortal wound wouldn't die. Is that right? It's been a long time. That was a book that I unfortunately lost track of when I stopped working at the old shop for about a year. But uh, I've been wanting to go back and get it. But Seeley's reliable. Like, everything he's ever done that I've read, I've always been. It's at, at worst, fine. <laughs> so, not to Dan with faint praise. And this is my pick for the shop also this week. This is Blue Book Number 1 by James Tinian the Fourth and Michael Avon Aim, oming or aiming the first two names that are pretty big it's a book about ufo abductions and it's going to uh it's going to feature like the you know 
true stories of UFO abductions. When I was a teenager, I was very into, and I still am, uh, like urban legend type stuff. Like I, I always liked the idea of there being monsters walking among us because I got news for you. They are. Um, you can ask most of my ex girlfriends. <laughs> <clears throat> and part of like all of that Bigfoot and Jersey Devil and stuff were the greys, UFOs, flying saucers and stuff like that. Silver Age sci-fi stuff, which, you know, has long been a thing of mine. So then the X-Files came along and kind of co-opted that part of it. And it kind of became, not mainstream, but it, uh, I think it did actually. Kind of UFO stuff kind of became more mainstream there in the uh, in the late, in the 90s and into the 2000s. And uh, I should know because I lived in Roswell, New Mexico in the summer of 2000. And let me tell you, if you don't think they're trying to cash in on that particular piece of para history, well, you have another thing coming. So... Typical of me, when everybody else gets into something, I'm like, eh, I'm not that interested <laughs> anymore. But then, um, not to it's not like I totally just was like, Bleh. I just, you know, it wasn't, um, UFOs weren't something I wasn't as interested in as I had. But I always did kind of maintain an interest. And then last year, I finally, finally, finally read The Mothman Prophecies, which I read because... Uh, one of my favorite bands these days is a band called the Ghoulies out of Australia, and they wrote a song about the Mothman. And I knew the basic story, but I never really had dove deep into it. And I think I had even I had edited a novel around the same time, or maybe somewhat before, that took place during the collapse of the Silver Bridge, I believe it was. And uh, the Mothman doesn't show up, but it was a really interesting setting for a coming of age story which i believe it was if i could remember the title i would tell you i don't know if it's going to get published <laughs> and uh so yeah i finally read the mothman prophecies and it scared the shit out of me i've forgotten how terrifying <laughs> where i grew up is uh in kind of rural san diego county and uh I, I've always remember this very clearly. My friend Omar, rest his soul, he died last year. Um, he and I were driving to our friend Dave's house, and we were taking the back road up from Harvest Canyon into Crest, and we were talking about aliens and seeing things and stuff like that, and we terrified ourselves <laughs> to where I could still kind of feel. And I remember we were coming around Dead Man's Curve, although I think it was it was really... Coming down was Dead Man's Curve. Going up, it was... You you were okay. But we were coming around Dead Man's Curve, and uh, Omar said, imagine if an alien just was, like, appeared right in front of us. <laughs> and we both just went, ah, scream. I was the one driving. I was milking a cow. <laughs> um, yeah, it's scary. So I like reading books like, or I like reading stories like this because, you know, whenever you hear like people talk about alien encounters and they say things like, oh, the aliens want us to be peaceful and they want to cure cancer and stuff like that. That's a nice thought. I am more of the mind that they're not malevolent or malicious if they are indeed aliens from outer space. I'm of the school of thought, and I don't think I'm alone in this, that this is all, this whole planet is just a massive science experiment for some faraway civilization. And they don't make themselves known to us because that would fuck everything up. It's called observer bias. Look at it. <laughs> that's so mean. And that's, I mean, I, I believe that more than other theories. I don't really believe it. If you get right down to it, my beliefs are nothing. We believe in nothing in Vasquez. But if I had to choose a theory, <laughs> that would be it. But I mean, the iconography of this sort of thing, the tractor beam, the saucer, 
I, it's, it's just, it's right up my alley. It's very Plan 9. It's very Close Encounters. I'm into it. And Tinian and Oming, I mean, Tinian, uh, big horror writer these days, he started with a book called The Woods, I believe. Yeah. And, uh, which I never finished, and which I only recently found out was apparently very similar to a manga from some years previous. But he's really blown up, Tinian, and, um, working for the big two and also nice house in the lake, which was his. And I think something is killing the children is also his huge. I've not read those books, oddly enough, but they're very big. And Michael Avon Oming has been around since the nineties and uh, he did powers with Brian Michael Bendis. That was probably one of his bigger things. The cross Bronx. He also drew great artists though. And, and very well cut out for this pick. O. The week, but up, doo Got another headache, and uh, Granddad needs some of his medicine, so let's finish this up. Okie dokie. First up, I read Torrent number one. This is very fun. Again, with the realistic superhero stories, which I'm never going to turn down, as it turns out. <laughs> um, and when I say realistic, I think what I'm really saying, because really most Marvel and DC comics are kind of the same. And, the only difference between the two, between Marvel and DC and other like superhero books that are like realistic, is that Marvel and DC have the weight of a universe behind them. With these sorts of stories, it's like, well, okay, we have to just kind of jump into it, and so just accept that there are superheroes in this world, and but there's also death and murder and stuff. <laughs> so our our hero Torrent here has her identity blown and it does not uh, bode well for her family. And so she's going to have to kick some ass and find out what's going on. I'm into it. It's another thing too, though. And I've not, I don't think I've said as much is that a lot of indie books nowadays can have a great first issue and still tank. And this one definitely had like, it didn't feel like just the first chapter in a story. Yeah, I already went on this run. I don't want to go on it again. So this is not as much here, but in this book, it definitely is. But this was still really great. And uh, it was exactly what I expected. A very violent, and there's a, the occasional swear word. Our main character here, his name eludes me at the moment, is looking for work. But the only way in this world that you can get work is to be a member of a guild, and she cannot get into a guild. So she takes a job. But she's not a quest, I guess I should say, in this context. She's not super stoked on, but... And and Haberlin also drew this, which I wasn't aware that he was going to do. So, And his art, for, like, he very clearly uses a lot of uh, computer effects and stuff. And he has kind of like a 3D style, which back in the 90s looked like dog shit to me. But now less so in his work especially because he draws Hellcop too and it's the same thing it works for his work i guess there's only there's one way to put it the way to put it if you will and then also icon versus hardware number one this is great they don't actually start fighting yet unfortunately but here you got icon actually where we focus more on rocket his sidekick who is going to a private school in europe and so her you know having to deal with that sort of shit, which I'm sure will tie back into the story because it's the, it's a crossover. This world's collide. And I think there's going to be other, you know, milestone characters are going to meet and fight. Um, the hardware's storyline. And this is also drawn by Dennis Cowan, uh, the original artist of hardware. Hardware goes back in time to try to fix things. And I, that's never a bad premise to me that Ray Bradbury story. I should really look up the name. But I love go back in time and step on a butterfly. I always love to see what happens after that. So when we get to when when hardware gets back to the present, um, he's changed his own origin. But so like his old boss and, and arch nemesis doesn't know who he is, etc. But then Icon shows up and is like, hey, uh, we have to talk. And I'm sure they mean by by talking, he means punching each other in the face. Because it's a superhero comic, and that's what I'm here for, certainly. Okay, that was this week. I'm going to go now.